Welcome back to the channel, Chris Morrison, Gulfside Ministries, and I am here today. Really excited to have D David. I've, I didn't ask. How do I say your last name? Baumgartel? I was trying that. Baumgartel. Baumgartel. I'm sure I'm the only person who has ever not said that exactly right the first time. <laughs> so, so, so what we're going to do this evening, guys, is we are going to uh, ask a for me, it's a fascinating question. Uh, Dave and I were talking on Twitter back and forth, and he has some thoughts that he's done some work on about the relationship between our ecclesiology and how that affects our eschatology. And David, I was telling you here before we started recording a moment ago that I have personally done some work on how eschatology impacts ecclesiology. And anybody who I think has spent much time in the theological world, probably, um, especially if you're in the grace camp, like uh, GES has published some stuff on how Augustine's uh, move from pre mill to a mill change the big issues in soteriology, but I don't think I've ever done the other direction. So we may go both ways in the conversation. But yeah. when you said you had done some how uh, ecclesiology affects eschatology, I'm like this is just this is just interesting. So um, before we get heavily into that, uh, eschatology is a huge deal. Ecclesiology is a huge deal. I don't know where all we're going to find out tonight. Let's just find out. Viewers, of course, questions, comments, cries of outrage in the comments. We'll get back to you as we can. Uh, but real quick, so David, why don't you just tell us a bit about yourself, who you are, um, things of that nature. Well, um, my name is David Baumgartel. I live in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, my day job is an engineer. Um, my wife and I attend a small church in Tacoma, Washington. I... Uh, I have a blog, uh, a very neglected blog at uh, testing521.com. You can follow me on Twitter at, at testing521. That's a reference to 1 Thessalonians 521, which says, test all things, hold fast to what is good. So mm -hmm. kind of my, my theme. Uh, I'm attending Southern Evangelical Seminary. I'm in a master's program there. So, Shout out to all of our um, Southern SES guys. I want to say, Richard, how if you ever see this, hi, thank you again for putting me on the path that you did. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll see him this weekend at the conference, actually. But yeah. Please tell him that I said hi. He has had a massive impact, massive impact on me. I am where I am today in large part because he started me in that direction. So I really appreciate that. Him and Thomas Howe and viewers, please check out SES. They're an yes. amazing school. They're absolutely phenomenal. So you're in a program over there, right? Yes. So is that the context where you were doing this work on the ecclesiology eschatology connection, or was yeah, that just was personal just, that you just? Yeah, I was just in one of their uh, systematic theology classes and wrote a paper on uh, the uh, the relationship between um, the nature of the church and the rapture mm -hmm. of the church and the, the questions gotcha. surrounding that so you threw two terms out there uh and let's just actually this is a great place to say i'm going to get into the actual substance uh, intros are awesome everybody fast forwards through them so if you did that go back and find out who dave is <laughs> but um you you quickly clarified and um nature of the church and rapture so let's before we get heavy into the conversation for anybody who doesn't know uh start us off if you don't mind with uh what is ecclesiology what is eschatology and just kind of give us a, the the general rundown of that yeah, absolutely. So uh, when I use the term ecclesiology, uh, it just means uh, the study of the assembly or the study of the church. And uh, and so that, that term ecclesia uh, in the Greek New Testament is translated church um, in English. And so it's the study of the church. And when I use the term, I'm thinking of the, the nature of a, and and purpose of God's church, the body of Christ, right? Um, so that term is often used for like, you know, how you conduct a Sunday service and that type of thing or liturgy mm -hmm. and all that. That's not really how I'm using it. It's related, but it's not exactly how I'm using it. Eschatology just means study of last things. Mm -hmm. So it's future things. It's also, it also affects the structure of history, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, right. in the study of eschatology, you would do a lot of uh, study of the history, the biblical history, right? Right. I like to think of eschatology, and again, tell me if you've kind of do, do it, gone a little different, different nuance on it. I like to think about the you talk about the direction of history, the the arrow, and where where the end goal of history. And if that's yes. the idea, then you can start doing, and you should, I think, start doing eschatology in Genesis chapter one, even though it's last things. It's I think it's rooted all the way back in Genesis. 
Well, absolutely. I mean, the the first three chapters of Genesis and the last three chapters of Revelation are bookends. So, you, so you let, let me ask one without the other. So let me ask you to kind of tip your hand right now where this is going to go, because eschatology, people build entire systematic theologies just on the way you do this. Uh, what is your, just if you could, let's just start by defining what is your general ecclesiological preferences and what are, what is your eschatological position? Yeah, so I'm a evangelical Christian. I'm a dispensationalist, dispensationalist. So um, whatever that means, right? We can get into what that right. means, but um, yeah. So, so folks like uh, Charles Ryrie and John Walford and John Nelson Darby would be uh, representative of my general approach to theology. And how I like to explain that is, you know, if you don't know what dispensationalism is and you want to categorize it, it's a it's a subset within evangelical Protestant theology. So it's yeah. It, it, it um it's well within that tradition right yeah that makes sense and again i don't want to be too basic but let's just i don't want to cover so what would you say are kind of the fundamental for you anyway what are the fundamental hallmarks because there are different versions of dispensationalism what are kind of the fundamental hallmarks of dispensationalism as you see it and adhere to it yeah so the so i like uh ryrie's uh essentials that he explains dispensationalism in his book dispensationalism which i highly recommend mm -hmm. um for sure but the, the the main two essentials to what dispensationalism is is uh a literal approach to interpreting the bible and uh which recognizes a distinction between israel and the church right and that leads to all sorts of other things, uh, right. things like premillennialism, right? We believe that uh, Jesus will return to the earth before what's described in Revelation chapter 20, which is a kingdom upon the earth, which will last for a literal thousand years before the eternal state, right? Right. So, Makes a lot of sense. So again, for people who are watching, um, this is why I'm taking the time to define some of these terms. Lots of terms get thrown out pretty quickly. Yeah. This is where you, this is just where study and show yourself for proof. This is why we have people like Dave who spent the time and go to go to seminary and, and teach the rest of us, right? <laughs> so we can, I think that point, we kind of have a good basic kind of very, very basic. We can go back and define as needed. I'm interested now in the conversation, the, the substance. So let me just ask in broad terms and let's just see where it goes. Uh, so your your argument is that how we view the church, how the church functions, the purpose and nature of the church, that has some impact on how we view the the arrow of history and what God is doing in the world. In the, I'm trying to use language. Feel free to nuance as you. Yeah, see absolutely. So if if you wanted to pull up a passage, we could go to sure. Ephesians chapter one. And I think this illustrates how how these two uh issues are interrelated so in chapter one uh verse 10 paul says you know this is in the middle of one big long sentence so i'm just going to pull mm -hmm. this this out of here but he says that in the dispensation or economy mm -hmm. or a phase of god's plan that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in christ both which are in heaven and which are in earth in him Mm -hmm. um that so what he's referencing there that uh dispensation of the fullness of times whatever that is mm -hmm. uh there's there's basically two ways that you could take it you could take that as describing what's going on right now mm -hmm. or you could describe that as a future era a future time at some time after what's going on right now if that makes any sense and depending on what you think the church is oh i see you will you will fall on one of those um mm -hmm. one of those different uh, options right so this comes down to you know before we even get to the new testament we have an old testament we have 39 books right mm -hmm. we have prophets we have history we have this whole storyline that's been building before Jesus mm -hmm. comes, right? And we have the gospels and then the apostles, which give us the new Testament. So that the old Testament really sets up at, uh, ex certain expectations for us. And right. You know, 
it 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 talks about uh you know a hope and promise and and blessing for all the earth and restoration of what was lost in in the genesis chapter three right with the fall right right uh, it promises a king and a kingdom and uh, a promised messiah right all these different things um the defeating of god's of the enemies of god's people and and all this mm -hmm. right and christians differ on how much of those promises and predictions have been fulfilled already mm -hmm. and 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 in and whom what, they're going to be fulfilled exactly because um if you so something surprising happens in the new testament lots of surprising things happen in the new sure. testament right so uh but but it, it, on some level uh what's happening with the church in the book of acts and in the epistles we all agree is something surprising and new the the question is um is this thing that's happening in the new testament church is that the the what was promised in the old testament is that mm -hmm. what fulfills the hopes and the predictions of mm -hmm. the old testament prophets or is this something new and all those promises and predictions or most of them or you know there's varying degrees sure uh, do do all of those await uh, a, a time of fulfillment after sure. what's happening right now after uh, whatever's going on here or in some other uh, body of believers or or some other uh, people group on earth or is it all f being fulfilled right now in some sense in the church so that makes a lot of sense because the standard argument from from the well let me not say standard the common argument if not standard from our amillennial brothers those people who yeah. believe that there's not going to be a future millennial reign for them that's that's this spiritual reign that somehow Christ is reigning over the earth right now the idea seems to be, as I understand it, uh, is that uh, all those promises that, that that you mentioned a few minutes ago, there's going to be a king, there's going to be a kingdom. And frankly, those those promises that the Jewish people themselves were expecting when Christ returned, that was one of the reasons they rejected him, right? Because he didn't bring deliverance from the Romans and a, a geopolitical kingdom. So that language in the Old Testament, they say, is being spiritually fulfilled in the church, and that it always... Should God always knew that, that that this would be spiritually fulfilled, not literally physic, not not literally and physically fulfilled? That's the argument they tend to want to make, right? Yeah, generally, I don't I don't want to speak for them. I'm I'm really good at uh, I I think I'm I'm decent at representing my own position. I I sure. hesitate to to <laughs> to speak for others because uh, it you know constantly what I'm doing online is uh, trying to correct. Right. Mis characterizations of my own view right so i do want to ca um be cautious about that but yeah that's uh that's definitely the opposite of where i sure. land on interpreting those prophecies in the old testament because the truth is so when i when i turn to uh ephesians chapter two let's go ahead and read and paul and um paul is oh, ephesians two Go ahead. Paul, Paul reveals is... so much about the nature of the church in the book of Ephesians and the book of mm -hmm. Colossians. Those are really, um, really important for ecclesiology. But in Ephesians chapter two, describing this church, this assembly, he says, which verse are we in? Are we starting starting verse one or are we going down somewhere? Uh, verse 14. Verse 14. All right. Yeah. So he, he's been he's been speaking of um, he jews and gentiles and mm. um and kind of doing this back and forth and he says for he himself is our peace who has made both one both jew and gentile one and has broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two thus making peace now i so i would emphasize and highlight that phrase one new man so um if you if you think of the church as uh a a continuation of israel mm -hmm. in the old testament right where uh you have you have this 
covenant community of uh, descendants of Abraham. And then the new thing in the New Testament is uh, Gentiles are now becoming mm -hmm. part of this. Okay. Uh, if if you if that's how you view the storyline of the transition from Old Testament to New Testament, mm -hmm. then uh, you could see how um, those promises that in the Old Testament really have a reference to the nation of Israel suddenly might um, might be fulfilled in the church. But if it's a if it's a new thing, if the church is not a continuation or replacement of Israel. But it's a a new thing then that might not be the case so so uh, you're taking it, man here this is say say more about how you're taking one new man so from the two so you you said a minute ago jews and gentiles that were your so who is the one for you uh the one uh the one new man would be the one body um so mm -hmm. it continues on. So like if we read verse 16, and that, that he might reconcile them, Jew mm -hmm. and Gentile, okay, both right. to God in one body through okay. the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. So okay. uh, so that, that one new man is this figure that he's using for uh, the body of Christ. Okay. Makes sense. Whose right. head is Christ himself in heaven and whose body is okay. our collective, uh, the collective you know, the collection of, of believers, right? So we have Jewish people, we have Gentile people who historically have been separated both uh, religiously by the law and every other which way, right? Covenants, et yep. cetera. And then we, for, we are emphasizing really not the oneness so much, you're emphasizing the newness of it. We have this new thing that wasn't there before in your, in your reading. Now they've been brought together for this new thing, this new body of which Christ is the head. And of course, that's, that's the reference to the church. Right. So he's not saying, hey, Israel changed. He's not saying the the, the nations changed fundamentally. He's saying that uh, individuals from those nations are taken and placed in this one new thing. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I want to add an observation. Tell me if this fits in because I'm doing this work in this way for the first time right along here with you. It says that so he is calling uh, was the contained in or OK, so the enmity and is describing the enmity is the commandments, and then we're putting to death that enmity. So that looks like he's saying we're putting to death the law. So he's separating the church can't be under the law. And if the church can't be under yes. the law, that seems to suggest to me that it can't be a reference to Israel. I, I'm trying to think out loud here because that would suggest that Israel themselves, the law has been has been killed in some way, that, that, that there's this fundamental transformation in Israel. And maybe... Maybe our amillennial reform brothers and sisters will be okay with that. I don't know that I am. Well, there's a lot we could get into with the relationship of of man to the law, the relationship of Israel to the law. Sure, all of this in, goes in a lot of directions. In this passage right now, though, he he's you know Paul uh, Paul is describing the enmity is not so much uh, between man and God, which mm -hmm. is definitely something that the cross reconciles right and that mm -hmm. part of it, this passage here but the the emphasis paul is placing on here is the enmity between jew and gentile right uh, so you who were far off they were far away from the jewish people is that what i'm hearing you say the, the gentiles far away from yes i'm sorry from, not from from the father from i mean the the jews had privileges in uh okay makes sense in the old testament they had fellowship with god right the gentiles had none of that they had none of those privileges right so okay. um but the enmity that he's talking about in this verse is really the enmity between jew and gentile right and that mm -hmm. separation was uh put in place by the law right because the law one of the things that it did was it kept israel separate and holy from the nations around her, right right um, right and, you know, you see that all over uh, the scriptures, remember, mm -hmm. where Peter is um, rebuked because he's going back to his old ways of not eating with the Gentiles, right, right in Galatians chapter 2. Yep. Um, okay, so where we, where were we going with that? But, uh, yeah, well, that so that brings up another interesting point about ecclesiology and how it affects the, the structure of eschatology is yeah. that... Uh, if you if you really understand that the church is not under the law, 
right is not mm -hmm. under the mosaic covenant in in any way uh mm -hmm. then that that will affect your reading of that structure of the biblical narrative as well um okay so so if the church is one new th if the church is a new thing uh mm -hmm. the question is is this is this new thing a fulfillment of what was promised in the past and is this maybe maybe this is what the the prophets uh wrote about in daniel and zechariah and isaiah right um and and maybe this is just a um a way we didn't see it uh, actually coming to pass uh maybe that's what's going on here except in chapter three paul before we go to chapter three i just want to make sure yeah, i'm absolutely. really clear with the logic because i think i am but just for me and others to follow along so so we've established here very clearly that there's a new body that's been created, which is the church. That's that's a new thing. So this yeah. is going this is going to raise the question. So we we already had this Old Testament trajectory in mind. So we're we're clearly in an eschatological framework because the Old Testament trajectory is in mind, promised to the Old Testament people. Now there's this new thing that wasn't before, yep. which is the church. You're saying that's going to raise a question: Is that church? the actual always intended fulfillment and the old testament trajectory people who preached just didn't see that and now we're going to discover that or is this something else so that uh i can't kind of the dispensationalists like talk about a parenthesis i don't know if you like that kind of language or not but is what? it something else is that kind of the yeah, logical right. question so, you're, so you're raising so to, to uh to to give the spoilers to jump to the end here so the way i see the the church is uh the church is a a new thing that wasn't revealed in the old testament that sure. wasn't the object of the promises of the old testament but is this new thing it was always in the mind of god right god mm -hmm. always sovereignly planned uh for this but he didn't reveal it until after right. christ ascended to heaven yeah. and he revealed it through his holy spirit in the apostles right okay. and so um, and so what that means is that all those promises in the Old Testament about a kingdom to and and a future for Israel and the, the all the nations of the earth being blessed through the blessing of Israel with a king reigning in Jerusalem, all that still awaits fulfillment, right? Okay. So so I think anybody who's knows dispensationalism, like, yeah, I got that I, I expected him to go there. So the question here from Ephesians 2 to Ephesians 3 so far, or Ephesians 1 to Ephesians 2 so far, has been the new church is here. Now is this new thing the church? Is this where it is the is the fulfillment of the old testament promises in the church or is the or are those promises still waiting fulfillment in israel and if so then what does that mean for the church that's kind of where we are at this point it sounds like yeah or we could we could we could recap it this way you know in chapter two uh the the church is one new man it's not a continuation of israel mm -hmm. it's not a change in israel it's a new thing so, so does again, that new thing replace emphasis on israel? this newness yep okay yeah. Okay. Perfect. Does that thing replace Israel or is it a separate um, kind of intervening thing? Okay. Excellent. So okay, in, good. Follow. In in chapter three, uh, right at the beginning there, he says, he, he introduces this word mystery. Uh, if indeed you have heard uh, in chapter, um, sorry, verse two, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation uh, or stewardship of the mm -hmm. grace of God, which was given to me for you, He's speaking to Gentiles, mm -hmm. how that by revelation, he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Now, what is that mystery? So let's pause there for a second. Um, so, Paul with his long sentences in Ephesians. Yeah, I know, right? I know. And 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 there's a there's a parenthetical in here. This right. is like a parenthetical within a parenthetical. Right. Of, uh, so break it down for us. What are you seeing? Uh, okay, so he's saying, uh, you know, this isn't something that Paul read in the prophets and is making an argument for. He's saying the Holy Spirit revealed new information to him, and he's sharing this with his okay. audience. Okay. I think and, that's probably a really important point. So Paul is not yes. doing an exegetical expository sermon here. He's saying, no, guys, this is this is fresh revelation. This is something yeah. that nobody knew in the past. 
Right. And that's in contrast with passages like, uh, you know, ma many passages in Romans or uh, Galatians uh, or the book of Hebrews, right, where most of that, is, you know, almost all of the book of Hebrews is is arguments based on past scripture, right? It's not like, mm -hmm. hey, this is a new information that me, the apostle, is telling you this is God's word, right? But here, this is Paul telling his audience, you know, basically, I'm prophesying. This, this is the word of the Lord, right? Right. Um, and so, by revelation, he made known to me the mystery. Uh, and so, what does the word mystery mean? Well, he mm -hmm. he said he explains what he means by that word in verse five, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit. So, in other words, a mystery is something that has not been revealed in the past but now has been revealed and and so it's not mysterious it's just yeah it's it's news that uh was unknown until now and it was been. veiled before it's now been unveiled to exactly use that, to use exactly. that related language okay so it okay. could so it clearly couldn't have been uh, the, the argument that you're building and i'm yes. firmly persuaded so far the argument you're building is that it would be it would be difficult to take Old Testament Israel, the church is continuing Old Testament Israel's promises because then it would look like that all this stuff that the the stuff that the church is fulfilling, in fact, had been revealed previously. That's the whole point. It was revealed previously. But you're right. saying Paul is just flat telling us that the church was an unrevealed thing. And right. so something else has to be happening entirely. That the newness thing was that's new, what what wasn't known about before. Exactly. So, so, yep. you know, the logic goes this way. Like if you think the church is the kingdom that was promised in the old Testament. Right. And I know people that think that if you think the church is the kingdom of God promised in the old Testament, then the, well, the kingdom of God was revealed in the old Testament that was promised mm -hmm. all over the place. And so if the church really is a mystery that has just now been revealed in the new Testament, uh, then it can't be that. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's one important way where the nature of the church affects your eschatological mm -hmm. view. So course, language clear there, kingdom of God language in equal to church. That's not, there, there may or may not be a relationship between the kingdom of God and, but the language itself is referring to different, or at least potentially referring to different entities. Yeah. And when, and in that moment, when I referred to the kingdom of God, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm referring to the, the eschatological kingdom mm -hmm. of God, what, however you cash that out in, in sure. your, in your interpretation. Right. But I'm, I'm not talking about the, the, you know, the, the sphere of God's rule that's always existed. So know? that's why I'm asking because uh, my, my day job, at least right now, I, you know, I was a chaplain for a long time, but right now um, my day job is I'm a, I'm a middle school teacher and we, it just so happens this particular last couple of weeks, we've been on um, the in two great, two classes, the first and second great awakening. We've been talking about how the phrase, the kingdom of God entered into the American lexicon and oh, how, uh, and it really is interesting. And it was closely tied to, I'm not going to get into the, this is another video, the, the social gospel and the progressive era and all those sorts of things. But the idea was recognizing that Christians should do more to bring about the sphere of God's influence on earth. And it, it is an American idea largely, but it's not a it's not this it's it's not this eschatological kind of dispensational idea. It's it's our Baptist brothers that I grew up in would, would talk a lot about doing kingdom work. Yeah. And so you're using kingdom of God in a narrower sense, and I think that's important right. to to bring out here. Yeah, I I have nothing uh, nothing against using it in a more broad sense. I I, I use the you know, I use the phrase in those broader senses myself, right? But okay, good. yeah, in this instance, I'm I'm referring to basically, um, you know, whatever is described in Revelation 20 or... Uh, or To be uh, fair, there are some yeah. dispensationalists who think, uh, I'm going to be a little not nice, and some of my dispensationalist brothers, and again, I count you because I'm a dispensationalist, but some of us sometimes get really, really, really hairy on, no, that, that word is a technical word that always means this, and sometimes it doesn't always mean so, uh, so we can use language shows, in a normal way that shows up a lot uh <laughs> especially if you get into the weeds of arguing about the timing of the rapture with people uh mm -hmm. they, there's so many i you know there's got to be a name i think there is a, a logical fallacy name for that type of thinking where you take a phrase and you and you give it a technical meaning and you always interpret it that way 
when really in context, it it's just as pliable as any yeah. other word. It would need it need to be the opposite of an illegitimate totality of transfer. It'd be the opposite of that, yes. right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> By the way, I'm going to use this chance since we're now talking logical fallacies quickly to um, pre-commit you to come back and talk about the relationship between philosophy and theology, because I know that you have thoughts on that, um, knowing the Howe brothers as you do. <laughs> oh, I love that topic. Yes. So we will have to come back. So um, obligatory like and subscribe for that interview. All right. So sorry, I, inter I interrupted you. So wh where are we now? So kingdom of God is a new thing. The church is a new thing, not the same thing as the kingdom of God predicted in the Old yeah. Testament. Right. So if we, you know, we can get into um, maybe some objections to how I'm reading this passage in Ephesians sure. if you really wanted to, but, but, if, you know, bear, you know, uh, bear. I have objections to the back of my mind, but I want to hear you build the case. And I don't, if you don't mind, yeah. I want to press so you on some. That, and that's fine. We can, we can talk about those, but if I'm, if I'm interpreting this right, and that mm -hmm. the, the church itself is a, a mystery is something not revealed in the old Testament, but now revealed uh, for the first time in the New Testament, then, it, you know, any reference to any unfulfilled promises to um, saints or or the people of God mm -hmm. uh, don't in the Old Testament don't necessarily uh, refer to the church. Any any reference to a collective body of saints definitely doesn't refer to the one uh, assembly uh, in in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. which means that uh you know all those promises await uh future fulfillment after whatever is happening right now and so that that phrase um in ephesians chapter one uh in verse 10 about the dispensation of the fullness of times mm -hmm. uh, i really think that's paul referring to hey there's something happening right now it's different from before uh before christ came and it it gives us insight into what's going to happen after this in a future sure. phase of God's purpose. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. All right. So we, are we still building or where are we going from here? Then that well, makes, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. I mean, so um, yeah, we could tease out some implications of that, I suppose, mm -hmm. but I really, I really think at this point um, it, when you, when you, realize that and, and then you go back and you read uh the prophets uh you can't help but come away with this premillennial viewpoint mm -hmm. and if the church really is this new thing and not part of the promises of the old testament but something uh, uh mm -hmm. surprising then uh, it, it can't you can't help but understand the church as something distinct from Israel. And if you have the church distinct from Israel, well, that's one of the essentials of dispensational dispensational and thought. If sure. you know how that, you know, um, the, the implications of, of that, that leads to the, the other distinctives of evangelical dispensational theology. It almost seems like that uh, if we adopt as, as people have since nearly the beginning of the church, um, a, a theology I'm not, I'm going to avoid the pejorative language that, you know, bounces around our circles for people who, who are not dispensationalists. <laughs> but if we avoid the theology that says the church has replaced Israel or the church yeah. is a continuation fulfillment of Israel, that yeah. if you, if you adopt that theology and you somehow make Ephesians one, two, and three refer to the, the, the continuation of, it seems like that you're committed, you're going to it seems like you're going to create a hermeneutical problem for yourself. And again, sorry for the technical language for the audience. And that now I, I have to find some way to recognize the fact that I have these highly physical king, like actual king languages, kingdom languages in the Old Testament. Yeah. But if I take my ecclesiology to say here that we're being, we're fulfilling that, that creates some sort of hermeneutical difficulty for, which means you can't take those texts at face value. I prefer face value over literal. You can't take them at face value in the Old Testament, yeah. can you? No, no, you can't. You can't read a passage like Daniel chapter seven um, or, or Isaiah 65 or Isaiah 11 and, um, 
and and map the details onto reality mm -hmm. uh very well because it, mm -hmm. it, it it's just so um yeah or you know zachariah 14 like how are, how are you going to describe uh, you know how are you going to um uh explain how that is fulfilled in in the here and now and in what's going on in the church right so uh, so again one of the things that I'm going to just give a, a 30 second soapbox of mine. One of the things that I'm forever saying on, on this channel and interviews elsewhere that I do is I'm a strong believer that exegetical theology comes before systematics and we should never interpret the Bible in light of our systematics. It seems like what you've built here is a case that says, if you take your ecclesiology, which is a portion of systematic theology, and you have adopted an ecclesiology that says that I am the fulfillment of the church. The church, rather, is the fulfillment of Israel. Yeah. Now, this creates a problem, an exegetical problem. So your systematics then becomes the lens by which you interpret the Old Testament. And I just think that's entirely backwards. Whereas, rather than making the argument that I've always made, I've always said that, I don't think this is a bad argument, I've always said, let's just let's just read the Old Testament, read it literally, and then let the chips fall where they may. You seem to be saying, that's fine, we can do that. But notice in Ephesians 1 through 3, it just flat tells us this is a new thing. So I'm under no obligation to come up with any kind of theological lens in which to reinterpret the Old Testament. There's no reason, there's no motivation for, for that isogetical lens. Am I? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So if you... um. I do think it, it only a logical approach to to scripture is to look at the progress of revelation mm -hmm. and to, you know, at each point that new revelation gets uh, bestowed on mankind by God, uh, you add that to your body of previous knowledge, right, of revelation. And so when you get to the New Testament, you have all the Old Testament you have a certain you have certain expectations in mind and most people would agree uh including many like amillennialists that um the picture you get at you know before christ comes is this this you know pre-millennial literal kingdom on the earth with messiah reigning in jerusalem right on david's mm -hmm. throne literally in jerusalem and so the question becomes well does the do the 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 you know earth shattering events of the new testament do does that give us uh reason to change our our expectation right does that it, um you know should we rethink that view of the world um based on the events of the new testament or do those events fit within our kind of uh model of eschatology um you know before before that hits and and i think we all agree and we touched on this before that there are certain things that um are pretty surprising in the new testament and one of the big ones uh that surprised a lot of jesus's followers is his death right um and now sure. jesus is quick to point out to uh followers especially on the road on the road to emmaus that um he the the christ needed to suffer before entering his glory right and right. The, and so the question then and, and and we can acknowledge that oh yes the old testament really did predict that the messiah would suffer in passages like psalm 22 and isaiah, sure. 53. isaiah 53 and yeah mm -hmm. yeah and so you do have this this uh this suffering messiah and this reigning ruling conquering messiah at the same time and it, it it's it isn't clear in the in the old testament how those fit together and when those events take place mm -hmm. and so it's it's you know understandable why um why jesus's followers or the jewish people would uh um be confused by the events of jesus's life but uh so so there are surprising things like that but they but they really were a part of the old testament now the question is um is there that kind of room for confusion or reinterpretation on the level of literal earthly reign of messiah or 
is it a spiritual sort of reign in the, in so the church? So to go back, for example, to, to all the way to Genesis 12, chapters 12, 15, and 17, for example, uh, Abraham is promised to you and your descendants, I will give this land. Yeah. That seems to me, again, if we're, if, if, if we take your ecclesiological argument that, well, the church just is the fulfillment of Israel, that has to be somehow reinterpreted in some spiritual sense. I don't think there's right. any way that Abraham could have understood that was a merely spiritual sense. And I, I kind of struggle with the idea that God tells Abraham, you're going to get this land, you and your descendants will get this land. And it's almost, I want to be careful not charge God with injustice. I think that's a dangerous argument, but it still feels to me like God is saying something he know is not he knows is not true. Yeah, it's hard to maybe misleading something like well, that. Well, you, you remember in uh Return of the Jedi when when Obi-Wan Kenobi uh tells Luke um what I said was true from a certain point of yeah. view and you think <laughs> oh, well, that's a big like uh right that's uh, retconning, right? That's yeah. George Lucas retconning his his script. Um, oh, that's so I, good. We... I I I don't. I I would never want to say God is retconning his script. You know. Listen, um, I'm clipping that out. This is the most important thing of this whole interview. People who are who are not dispensationalists, they are they believe God retcons the Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, well, I, yeah, you read the Abrahamic promise or the Davidic covenant or you know I, any number of passages in the Old Testament, and you and you try to you, you try to explain to the original audience of those things. Oh, actually, this, and you describe, you know, an amillennial viewpoint. Um, it just it sounds like Obi Wan Kenobi saying, "Well, from a certain point of view, that." Sure is could be fulfilled in this and the only way to justify that go ahead go ahead yeah well i was just saying that that sounds really harsh and unfair and i've got a lot of you know i have a lot of uh friends who are you know all millennialists and i would never impugn their motives but no and again friends of the channel know that we can we can pick and play i i have utmost respect for them but i think it is worth every position should recognize there are some there are some dangers in any given position and even dispensationalism has plenty of dangers well we might touch on them in just a second uh but i it sounds like one of the dangers might be of the non-millennial uh post-millennial type interpretation might be something like well you're at the risk of you're at the risk of making god say things that he didn't actually mean and that's what you can appear that way and that's something i think yeah if our friends on the other side, so we're, so if we're the goal of this is not to generate heat, but rather light, uh, if that's the goal, then people should be aware that's 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 an issue that's out there that needs to be addressed. I think, yes. or at least be be very cognizant of if you if you take that view. Yes, absolutely. You know, one thing uh, before before we forget or move on to another topic, I did want to uh, kind of tie up a loose end uh, that you know the the there. Were, you know, I said there were certain things that we all agree are kind of surprising events in yes. the New Testament, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think of somebody like Simeon or Anna, uh, you know, part of that that remnant that that were believers mm-hmm. at the time of Christ's coming, who mm-hmm. really did understand um, the Word of God, mm-hmm. right? And, and uh, or or Zacharias's prophecy at the beginning of Luke, uh, um. And and so it you do have that ep- expectation with the the faithful followers of Christ, uh, and and so with the events of the New Testament and this new thing, the church, you would expect lots of questions to come up, like okay, well, how is that? Mm-hmm. You, you know, what about uh, Israel, right? And you, but you, um, you do see the writers of the New Testament addressing those questions right um, like one great example is acts chapter one uh verse six where the apostles the disciples are asking um uh, the resurrected lord jesus right before he's ascending to heaven uh therefore when they had come together they asked him saying lord will he, will you at this time restore the kingdom to israel you know, showing that they still had that expectation right. of 
that Old Testament promise to uh, a kingdom for Israel. Now, what was his answer? Of course, he this was a perfect opportunity for him to say, well, actually, you you misunderstood all those things, right? But he says, no, it is just not the time for you. It, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Which almost seems to imply, and I don't want to overread the text, yeah. that uh, it, it seems to imply that there is a time, a season to come when there is a restoring of the kingdom of Israel. That yes. seems not yet. That seems the natural implication of that passage. Absolutely. And then, you know, his next statement is, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. In other words, like, hey, that's not for you to know. I've got something else for you to do. I've mm -hmm. got something else awaiting you. Um, and and then you get the narrative of the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost, right? And the church beginning. And, and uh, you know, another place in the New Testament where these expectations uh, naturally bring up qu these questions of, well, what about all those promises to Israel in the Old Testament? Uh, Paul addresses those in Romans chapters 9 through 11, right? Right. Because all you know, chapters one through eight of this glorious uh, ex, uh, explanation of the gospel where Jew and Gentile alike uh, can come to a salvation by grace through faith. Mm -hmm. You know, that and all these promises of, of chapter eight and the love of God um, and nothing being able, nothing uh, being able to separate us from the love of God, right? You have this awesome high point in chapter eight and the natural question that would come to Jews is well, what about Israel and right. to Gentiles as well? The nat the question would naturally arise, like, okay, how can I trust all these promises mm -hmm. that you just laid out for me? Uh, so, if I can put on my apologetic hat, this is an argument that I've personally used against, yeah. say, for example, Mormons who want to say that uh, that that there is oh, yeah. a whole new thing. That has been established that what came before has been has been superseded by a new revelation that kind of language right and one of the arguments i have made is that well if if god can come along hundreds thousands of years later and say yeah what i said before you know let's let's supersede that with something new and yes. let's uh then how do how do you know mr mormon that the thing that you believe isn't going to be superseded by something else later on that creates the risk of you can't believe god anymore yes and, yes and so and so that now that question would come uh to the audience of romans naturally they would say well if 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 this uh if i can't trust those promises uh, to israel in the old testament if if i can't trust in the the promise to abraham uh in genesis 12 and 17 mm -hmm. 22 then how can i trust these promises in romans chapter 8 right right so nothing can separate us but then what about the jewish people yes who have who seem to have been separated from from uh the the love and the fellowship of god and right. um and and yet they received very, very strong promises mm -hmm. that they would never be um, not you know, forsaken. There, the, this does raise a potential objection. And forgive me, I'm um, this is not an area I'm like I said, I'm a super expert in, but there's some language in here that is often used by my by my Reformed and Calvinist brothers. Not, not all Israel is Israel. Is that here in is that here in this passage? Yeah, yeah here we are. So, yeah, right here in verse six, right? So can't this be used to say, well, but this is just proof that the church is Israel. That's that. That's just what he says, because it's by your seed you'll be called. And that's Galatians, where the seed isn't that doesn't that just kind of this whole thing is we're just wrong. This is the church is Israel. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I, I would, I, I, you know, I would argue, I would assert that there's no place in the New Testament where the term Israel or uh, descendants of Jacob or seed of Israel or seed of Jacob is ever applied to anybody but at physical descendants of mm -hmm. Jacob. And the same is true here. So uh, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. That's That can be kind of a confusing sentence. Right. But if you diagram it, it's saying for they, uh, who's they, the, the they there is who are of Israel. In other words, the descendants of Jacob. Mm -hmm. 
national not, physical descendants, right? Right. For uh, not all of them are true Israel is basically what he's saying there. Yeah, and and so um, it's a narrowing of a category. I was going to say category that... is descendants of Israel, mm -hmm. physical descendants of Jacob, and he's saying not all of them are true children of the promise. Right. Right. Yeah, you pushed so it again. It, yeah, and he's not he's not bringing in other people into this category of true Israel. He's he's mm -hmm. narrowing the category. So he's saying, and, and that that uh, you know, it showed up earlier in in uh, Romans chapter two as well, and some other places where he's saying, no, the true Jew is the one who has faith. The true Jew uh, mm -hmm. is the one who actually believes the promises to him. Right. So it, you, you posted, uh, I'll, I'll plug your Twitter again. You posted on Twitter some time ago, a diagram in which you have national Israel and then inside of national Israel, you have a bubble representing spiritual Israel. I yes. think that's how you have uh, that. But Yeah. But, and if you go to my blog, testing521.com, uh, there's a link at the top, Romans 9 through 11. And that um, I have a, a YouTube link on there of when I give a talk on those chapters uh but then i also have nice. uh, a, a series of blog posts where I, okay. I run through those three chapters so please check it out if so, you're interested. dear viewer yes and here you go has god's word fail so yeah this yeah, is so that's part just... two right there has the if you click on part two it has that diagram that you're mentioning ah yes there you go see there you go so see th and this was in my own seminary studies many, many moons ago, I, I remember when I had this revelation that this was a narrowing because it almost seems like that uh, my reformer brothers and sisters of whatever particular camp, they they almost have an expansive view, not all Israel is Israel, which they almost view that as a sense of, well, but we who are not Israel, we're the true Israel because we've believed. So they right. they have the exact opposite. They would have national Israel, spiritual Israel on top of that is almost what it seems like. Yes, exactly. And that's just not what the grammar and context are doing in Romans chapter nine. And that's proven by the next few verses that that describe uh, that describe uh, a narrowing of uh, mm. the the people who are the objects of the promise to Abraham, right? So you have it's not Ishmael, it, you know, of the sons of Abraham, it's not Ishmael, it's Isaac. It's not the sons of Keturah and Ishmael, it's Isaac. And right. then here's your famous Jacob, I have Isaac, loved Esau, I've hated. Yeah, right. Within Isaac, you have Esau and Jacob. And even in the case of twins, he goes into that argument, right? It's a, it's a narrowing to Jacob. Uh, and so, you know, his argument in that passage is basically if God has the sovereign right to choose to bless Jacob rather than Esau, then he has the sovereign right to bless a subset of Israel's descendants right. rather than all of them. And, and, is, and the point is that Israel, the, you know, the mass of of Jews that have rejected Christ, uh, they're trying to seek righteousness by the works of the law and not by faith, as the end of right. chapter nine talks about. And so God has every right to bless uh, the, only those of faith. He's not obligated to bless a Jew just because he's a descendant. And that seems Jacob. consistent with the whole of Old Testament theology, but especially later theology, where you get into remnant theology and the later, the yes. minor prophets. Uh, we see that, for example, in the you know kings. Well, I have seven thousand who have not who have not bent the knee to Baal. But yes. then you also have that that whole notion of I'm going to bless her and I'm going to, I'm going to keep a remnant. It seems like that it, this there's never been an expansive view of Israel in the Old Testament except for the promises of the millennial kingdom. That's expansive. Yes, everything yeah, else is the, narrowing. Yeah, the expansive part of of. Romans chapters 9 through 11 is at the end, uh, Romans 11, 9, 26, where he says, and Let's so just... all Israel shall be saved, right? Paul's capstone of 26, his argument. 26, right? Yeah, 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 verse 26. The capstone of Paul's argument, it, answering the question, well, what about Israel? So the church is here, Jew and Gentile are on this equal footing in Christ. Uh, what about the promise to, it, promise to Israel? Why is God why does it seem like God has set aside Israel? His, his, his culmination, Paul's ultimate answer to that is 
he set aside them temporarily and not forever because he will graft them back into their promise. I think that temporary piece is important because if you go to 25, he says here, don't be ignorant. He's talking to the to the to the church. You know, I don't yeah. want the church bring it, lest you be wise in your opinion, that blindness has happened in part to right. Israel. So not all Jews, right? Because there are some that believe and they are mm -hmm. those Jews in the church. Right. And this is this can't be a reference to the church. We can't say that part of the church is blind. <laughs> right. They're talking actual Israel. And then it says until. Yep. The fullness. Well, that implies that the that blindness will, will go away. Right. It implies the blindness will end. Yeah. And then when it ends, all Israel will be saved as it is written. And now we're back to this is center, this is not a mystery anymore. This is back to the revelation of the Old Testament yes. to tie us back into your Ephesians theme. Yes, because and, this was prophesied. And that's God. when I take away their sins. That means the Jewish people's sins. And then it goes on and it goes on from there. That's phenomenal. No, that's that's really really good. Let me. Um, do you have something? Do you want to tie up there, or because I want to raise just a small objection? I think it's nothing knocked down. But... No, go for it. So one of the objections somebody might have is, look, you're building a wonderful, you know, you're you're going to Paul and you're building this this theology, but they might accuse us of doing the very thing I warned earlier about, which is just not taking the text at face value. I mean, people like Jesus quite a bit, right? And everybody goes to Mark. I mean, what's the very first thing? Where's where is it? Is it Mark? Where is it? Jesus. The very first words he comes. Where is it? Jesus uh, after his baptism, after temptation. There you go. First things Jesus says: the time has come, fulfill the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So Jesus seems to be connecting the kingdom of God, which we've been talking about, with the gospel itself. Repenting and believing the gospel. So doesn't Jesus? Isn't Jesus just saying here whatever? Don't misread Paul. The fact of the matter is the, the kingdom of heaven, it, it's here. I'm bringing it. Repent. The gospel is the kingdom is here. So that's the foundation for everything else. Yeah. I, that phrase at hand, uh, it means it, it's ready. It's it's uh, it's at the door. And uh, a lot of dispensationalists like to talk about Jesus offering the kingdom to Israel. And I think a better way to phrase it is Jesus is offering himself as their Messiah and the kingdom would come upon their acceptance of him. And so they reject him. So their kingdom is postponed, basically, is how I would. So we're allowed to totally take kingdom of God in that Old Testament sense of the word. This this is the kingdom of God is not a reference to the church. Yeah, and I don't think this verse uh, would logically lead to that at all. And its association with the gospel is easy because Jesus is the gospel. His death on the cross is both the foundation of the church and the foundation for the future mm -hmm. kingdom. Uh, Revelation 5 makes that pretty clear that the lamb slain is worthy to take the scroll mm -hmm. uh, at, you know, as the, the slain lamb, right? Uh, theological objection again this is this is softball stuff but there are people who will say this isn't there a suggestion then that there are two different peoples of god that you know that the two different people save two different ways and don't you oh. have this i mean yeah um so john nelson darby who's uh every every anti-dispensationalist loves to bring up john nelson darby but uh he has a, and you have all of his works on your Twitter. I, I love that you have all those those books on your. Yeah, shelf. <laughs> I have the collected writings. Uh, um, uh, a good a good friend. Um, I have to pull that up while you talk and just show off. Keep keep talking about Nelson. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. So he has a great quote, um, and it just demonstrates that this this lie that dispensationalism teaches to there you go. salvation. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's amazing. I love that. <laughs> uh, it's great. I I need to dive into those more. They're rich. They're some of them are really hard to hard to get through. Darby wasn't the clearest of writers all the time. But, that's the example uh, we're talking about. Now I might uh, suggest. Yeah, he was very insightful. But anyway, uh, he has a great quote. He says, um, "Oh, you know what? Like, I I had to pull it up. I'm gonna butcher it if I try to do it from memory. I've, um, I've done that a time or two. Yeah, no problem." And then I have another one that's based on Jesus. I think it's always a good idea to go to Jesus. That's probably um. Oh yes. Um, because I will say, as you're finding it, one of the strengths, rhetorical, whether the logical or theological 
play plays out uh, plays out one of the rhetorical strengths of of um, our Calvinistic reformed and theolo theological uh, um, you know reformed theological amillennial brothers and sisters they do at least seem to put more emphasis on the centrality and the work of Jesus and they seem to want to have a I have a Christological hermeneutic and that's just kind of language oh. that they use yes uh, and that that I think for a lot of people is I I I resonate with and am sympath am sympathetic to with that that emphasis. I mean, we're called Christianity, you know. We're not called mm -hmm. you know, we're called, called churchianity, and that may be again rhetorically powerful. Yeah. So so that quote uh, is this. Um, he says to say this is John Nelson Darby to say that all saints from the fall are righteous in the same way is scriptural. To say that they are all the church is contrary to scripture. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, every saint, we could talk about the category of all the saints, all the redeemed that will be with, with Christ in, in the eternal state, all the redeemed, uh, every single one of those people are saved by grace through faith on the basis of uh, the sacrificial atoning work on mm -hmm. the cross, right? Every single one of them. But but the church, uh, we would argue, is a, a a subset of that broader category, a kind of unique, special subset of that broader category of the saints. So if you want to talk about one people of God, we can talk about one people of God and, and talk about the category of the redeemed throughout the ages. Um, but if you if you want to get into the multifacetedness of that one people of God, we're going to talk about distinctions within that. And one of those is the body of Christ. And one of those is, you know, from the nations. And one of those is the, 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 the saved among Israel. And again, I think that your exegetical basis, you already covered that is Ephesians one through three, which seems to make, yeah. it seems to make that there. All right. Another objection. And I can never, at 16, I just, I'm going to pull 16 through 18 up all together. Uh, Jesus just says, uh, after your great confession, uh, uh, by the way, I think that my fellow free grace brothers don't put nearly enough emphasis on Peter's great confession. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. I, I needed, to do, needed to do a whole video on that. In any yeah. case, uh, but he says here that you are Simon Bar-Jonah without getting to the Pope argument. It says, you are the Peter upon this rock. I will build my church. Now, the standard, I don't know your take on this. I kind of have a quasi-heretical view, I think. <laughs> but the standard way to take this is that Jesus is predicting the church. So how can Paul say that it's not a revelation here, that it's a new revelation? Well, I have my opinion, so you can disagree with me. And put, I'll put you on the spot. Well, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm open to other takes on this, but I would just say that, you know, Jesus in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18 uh, previewed this assembly and, and even gave principles that would that would apply to it but paul's paul's point in that this is not revealed in past times really refers to the old testament so we you know okay. we would deny that that jesus began to reveal truths about the assembly uh but okay. we but I would emphasize that most of the 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 truth about the nature of the church came after Pentecost, which and, so we'll go ministry, and so yeah. we're going to go there next. And I think you've already touched on Pentecost. There was an offering the kingdom versus offering the Messiah. That's the next, the last really big object. Well, the second last big objection I want to raise. I just want to kind of tick through these. I'm trying to be honest with people who might be watching this and kind of imagining what they might say. My own view, just for you to consider. Oh, yeah, reject, no, I'm curious. Go um, is so I I. I I don't actually think Jesus has in mind what Paul calls the church at all. I think this might be a bit of reading Paul back into Jesus. Uh, ekklesia there is a Greek word. Jesus probably wasn't speaking Greek, and this is in Matthew for a reason. Uh, ekklesia in the Septuagint, that's just that's just the reference that, that the Septuagint uses to refer to the assembly of of the Lord. I, I think this is a ultimately a millennial kingdom reference. I think that he's going to build my assembly, my ecclesia, the ecclesia to the, the the actual assembly that has been promised in the Old Testament. I think I'm going to build that. And Peter, you're going to be right there at, at the foundation of that. And this personally, gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I actually don't see this as an as the gates of hell as offensive. They're attacking the church. I think this is defensive. If Hades the hell is that's where the dead people are 
And so I think that is the, at the, when the resurrection happens, in the millennial kingdom, that the gates, I can't get, I can't get into the grave. To, I, I can't get into hell and out because the gates are too powerful for me, a mere mortal, but Christ is going to storm the gates of hell and bring his, he's going to resurrect you from the dead, bring them back. And there's nothing hell can do about it. He's that powerful. I, I, I like I like that. I, I have no, you know, I have no uh, major objections or problems to that take on that verse. Um, I especially like the the idea of the gates of hell um, not prevailing as a reference to the resurrection. I think that's ultimately probably right. Now, I haven't done enough work to know if that has any reference to the debated 19 about binding and loosing, but that's just the way I see I see 18. <laughs> uh, no, that I'll have to read that in in light of that that idea. So I'll have to think about that one. Um, uh, oh, it's OK, we can move on. <laughs> sure. well, uh, and the other one, I don't, we might have to go there, but but so Peter is in. Well, let's just go look at it real quick. I don't want to spend too long there. But the other one is again just trying to te trying to test whether or not this 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 distinction of the church is it really ecclesiologically to keep with our theme of the conversation is it really yeah. a new thing or is it a continuation? Peter here clearly this is the resurrection, the the Pentecost has happened, and when he is preaching the gospel and in the five thousand people are going to be added on this day, right? He preaches here of the prophet Joel. And again, this looks like a common dispensational pitch here is that Peter is making yet another offer of the kingdom to, to Israel. And my reformed brothers and sisters just kind of shrugged. Look, he's he's preaching the same thing Jesus did. And so the message of the of the apostles is including Paul is the same thing that Jesus preached. That and we have it right here. This is this is Old Testament revelation that Peter's talking about. So what say you to an argument like that? You know, I I think I should, uh, one of these days I'm going to really dig into that and give like a, a really detailed answer to it because it's a really interesting question, but I don't think it's, I, I definitely don't think it's unanswerable. And I think that uh, a lot of what uh, happens around this time especially the ministry of peter and the other apostles to uh the jews to the the nation of israel that happens in the first part of acts yeah, that's through like around about chapter 15 or so right yeah the that's going to happen a, again in a big way in daniel's 70th week or the tribulation mm -hmm. right before jesus comes back and right. in in that and at the end of that period, unlike in the beginning of Acts, uh, the the nation as a whole will repent and will believe that Jesus is their Messiah, right? And here, right. what happens is, well, they reject, they ultimately reject the teaching. A lot, a, a lot of, of Jews and other people respond to the teaching uh, and right. the preaching of the apostles. Which might be your remnant idea that we had in Romans and I yeah, earlier. and that remnant of Israel uh, it, right now, there's always been a remnant. That remnant right now are the are the Jewish believers that are a part of the church. And so mm -hmm. throughout history that, you know, God has had a remnant. Um, and that's, that's you know, uh, just as true today as it, as it will be in the, the, the tribulation and uh, as it was in, in uh, Elijah's time, right? Uh, so go ahead. Go finish so just to, just to, um, circle back so so i i would um without getting into the details of of what peter's doing here uh, i see that as part of uh the ministry of the disciples appealing to the nation of israel in the early part of acts because because the holy spirit is still uh basically offering the kingdom to them if they would repent in the early part of Acts, and that ends with the stoning of Stephen, and it, and you see in the book of the rest of the book of that Acts, the Holy Spirit does not appeal to the leadership of Israel anymore. Even gotcha. when Paul tries to, he's he's stopped at the end of the book of Acts, right? And right, the Holy Spirit is saying, "Well, I'm not going to appeal to the nation a, as a whole. I'm going to appeal to uh, you know individual Jews and Gentiles throughout the world now," and that's 
Uh, there's a lot there, but that's kind of what's going on in the book of Acts. Sure. No, opinion. that makes a ton of sense. The fact okay. that, uh, and I love the idea, again, going back to your earlier language based, based on Matthew, um, and I know we can we can talk about offering the kingdom. There's nothing wrong with that language, but your earlier language about <clears throat> offering the Messiah. Uh, yes. Christ is the Messiah. And to this point, there are believing Jewish people who have, uh, they've believed that Jesus is the Messiah. So uh, maybe we shouldn't be too surprised to see that kind of stuff happening, but it looks like the leadership puts the kibosh on it. They say, no, we're, we're, we're rejecting again. We've crucified him. And now there are some who believe, but overall we're still rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. And that's what the story of Acts seems to be to tell, seems yeah. to be telling us something yeah, like absolutely. that. Yeah. And it's good to make the distinction between the nation as a whole or the leadership of that nation with individuals, you know, that okay. come out of that nation to join the church. Now, I, I am sure that there are reformed people who have other passages in their mind. Um, if nothing else, I, I, I hope that people see that the, uh, I, I think I'm trying to fairly represent the kind of passages they would, they would give that there are genuine arguments to make. Let me offer two more very, not exactly exegetical based, but theological troubles. Sure. Um, so if I can I have, watch me forget the second one, but the first I have in mind is, um, isn't it possible? Well, let's look at some of the abuses of dispensationalism. Um, we we have yeah, date setters every time you turn around. How I mean, late great planner of Hallens. Every time you turn around, there there are date setters, and at least at the time of recording this, there's stuff going on in Israel, and um, uh, some of it's really exciting for our dispensational friends. And and but it seems like there's a lot of people who take this stuff way too far. Doesn't that suggest something wrong with the system? Because how many times have we been wrong? Well, I, you know, I would just say that you can you can turn that same argument into an if that's an argument against dispensationalism, you can technically make that same argument against Christianity because dispensationalism is a subset of Christianity. So, are you arguing against Christianity based on the abuses that Christians do with it, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and I would say not necessarily. So you would have to, you, you can't, um, uh, you, you have to judge the implications of the ideas themselves. And so if uh, you, you would have to argue that the, the logical outworking of the, the, the theology, not just the theologian, you have to that's a good distinction natural. theology to theologian okay right so if the logical outcome of the theology leads to these abuses that we all agree are wrong then you would have an argument against the theology but if it's just that humans are sinful and uh often do things inconsistent with their own stated theology then that's not really an argument against the theology so then rather than directing our comments to critics here, we do have dispensational brothers and sisters who do tend to fall into these sorts of errors where they, yeah. whether there's actual date setting or over reading events and things like that. And uh, what, uh, rather than talking to critics, what what would be your advice for, for, you know, Jesus does say be ready and look at the times. And so it, how, how do we walk this line between reading the world in light of what Jesus and Paul has said versus falling into those errors. And because uh, that's the, uh, that seems to be the natural abuse of, of dispensational thought is it's easy to overinterpret current events. Yeah, absolutely. So the first bit of the, the first thing I would, I would remind uh, a fellow dispensationalist of is that um, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So Revelation 1910, um, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's it's the it's true in the reverse too. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And so if you are um if you are getting excited about prophetic things and that isn't ultimately pointing to uh the glory of Jesus Christ, you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And um what Jesus tells us, tells the church to be ready for is Jesus himself. We're to be waiting for God's son from heaven to rescue, who rescues us from the wrath to come. And I, I'm, 
most dispensationalists are pre-tribulationists, which mean we me, which means we believe in the imminent return of Jesus for the church, mm -hmm. which means that the next thing on the prophetic timeline is the Lord's coming for his church. Mm -hmm. And so um there isn't uh we we won't be around to see the the fulfillment of these specific prophecies about the tribulation or the judgment right. of God on the earth. Um there will be people who turn to Christ during that time who will see these things unfold. And so, you know, the all of that discourse will become very, very particularly relevant to people right. in the future. But to me, I'm not I'm not looking at the the headlines and uh and trying to discern what's going to happen right around the corner. Is Jesus going to come back soon? Because nobody knows the day or the hour. And if the next prophesied event on God's timeline is the rapture of the church, I'm just looking for Jesus. Right now, now it is good to be aware of what's going on in the world. It's good to be praying for things that are going on in the world. And so I, I, I do think that there's a healthy awareness of, of the headlines. Right. And I, I also want to, to acknowledge that there's, there's good in showing people how these events could take place. Soon, I agree with that. Imminently, right? And so I, I I don't think all of that speculation is wrong. What what it gets wrong when it becomes a distraction. It gets mm -hmm. wrong when it takes your eye, eyes off Jesus. Does that make sense? That does. So it's it's a really a matter of emphasis. So uh, yes, again, absolutely. So we, we can look at, and we can, we can, in fact, maybe should. Uh, it can, to the extent that it feed our feeds our souls. Look at what's going on. Like again, at, I don't want to go too far off topic on this, but as as of you and I are recording this video right now, Israel is at war with Hamas, and this could be a prelude to the removing of the temple. I mean, uh, if, if Twitter is to be believed, and it may not be, Hamas has issued a formal statement that the purpose for their attack is to prevent Israel from building that third temple, which dispensation is like, see, this is what we've been saying for a long time. That fits. Yeah. Um, and right, it all fits. Um, the fact that Iran and Russia are uh, still players in this grand opera also fits what will happen mm -hmm. in the end times but um it could but i you know it's it's important to point out to people that uh it could be 500 more years before christ comes back in right? in a week but, from now tomorrow this particular conflict could simmer down and it could just go back to the status quo and it could that doesn't mean absolutely yeah and we could get we could get raptured tomorrow and it take you know an unknown amount of time before uh antichrist shows up and makes a covenant with israel right but all those things uh, you know it could easily take place um and and i think that is important to point out that you know that, that you know god's uh, unfolding of his plan um you know he can easily make it happen mm -hmm. right let me let me stay on this road. Uh, less objection, but more it, more practical advice for our fellow dispensational brothers and sisters. And again, if and if I'm putting you on the spot here, so if you can always say, "Don't know," I'm not not going to answer. <laughs> That's allowed. Okay. <laughs> um, let's let's just stay with some of the current events for a minute, because again, this this is hot in in the theological circles you and I walk in right now. Yeah. Um, since we know not all, not all Israel is Israel. Uh, what advice do you have for, I'm going to pull this screen off of the time being, we can go back and share if we need to pull more verses up. As soon as I do that, you know, it's going to happen. You're going to be like, let's, look, let's, let's look at more scriptures again. <laughs> but what does this mean for people who are supporting say national Israel? Um, because this is, there are a lot of people who tend to be in premillennial dispensational camps who I am pro political Israel because Genesis says, I, yeah. I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. Yeah. And that seems a reasonable argument. And you get really scary real quick into arguments about supporting the Palestinians and anti-Semitism. Yeah. And this gets really nasty really quick. Yeah. So, but all Israel is not Israel. So where again, where where is where's the balance, Dave? You're a dispy hipster. Where's the balance? I love that. Uh, the 
So the balance is recognizing that God has a future for ethnic Israel, that God loves Israel, that God loves the Jewish people. Uh, Paul's heart for them in the beginning of Romans 9, where he would be accursed for their sakes if it could save them. Um, that's Jesus's heart for them too, because he was a curse for them on the And cross. he's talking about unbelievers there, the unbelieving Absolutely. Israel. He wants, he, right. would, he would give himself up for the unbelieving Israel. He did. And Jesus did give himself up for the unbelieving Israel. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. And, and so, and so I think we all need to have that heart for the lost, whether they're Jew or anybody else. Um, and you can you can agree with that whether you're a dispensationalist or not now um as a dispensationalist i do recognize that there is a that god has a future plan for ethnic israel which also means that satan uh is motivated to foster anti-semitism and he still is he, you know he was before christ came and he still is because god still has a plan for them right um but it is good to recognize that they're uh as a nation um they don't they they are still in rebellion against their messiah and unbelief um so that means that they're sinners just like us uh they can ha have wrong policies uh right the the government of israel isn't there's nothing right. there's nothing holy about uh, their foreign policy or mm -hmm. or um domestic policy right um having said that uh, they absolutely have a right to that land, uh, and and they will have that land someday. Mm -hmm. um, other things I could say, oh, well, just st stepping out of the theology side of things right now, I think just uh, morally speaking, um, they have every right to defend themselves, um, just like any other nation. So, sure. And I would caution people because there's so much anti-Semitism out there and, and anti-Israel bias in the media. I would mm -hmm. just take take headlines with a grain of salt, right? Take mainstream media with a grain By of salt. By a grain, if you mean a mountain of salt. I yeah, totally, absolutely. <laughs> totally, totally agree. All the no, we, we don't need to be uncritical in what Israel says, but at the same time, we don't need to therefore just... Uh, at the risk of being uncharitable, yeah, yeah. we can we can virtue signal by just by being on being against them. Absolutely, and uh, I would I would also remind people that like uh, shouting opinions on social media, what what does that really accomplish? Right? Are you unless uh, you know unless you are, and you know talking about uh, we should support Israel. Well, who are you? who's we when you say that do you mean americans yeah and, and it you know you can what kind of influence do you have on the united states is right see uh maybe with your vote i guess um yeah. but shouting again shouting and vir virtue signaling online um really accomplishes nothing so i would just kind of take a humble pill Good. with the idea of supporting this or supporting that that helps a lot. And then the last thing that kind of on my agenda um, is uh, looking at uh, th this. This might be to the, the, more, the more theological. This might be back to the actual lessons of the theology of dispensations, a potential objection. And again, you yeah. can address the objection and then I'll invite you to make any positive um, advice you might have for for dispensationalists themselves. Uh Dispensationalists, man, we love our distinctions, man. I, and this on this conversation, pre mill, post mill, ah mill, the rapture as yeah. opposed to the second coming. You talked about the subset within the people of God versus we talked about remnant. I mean, distinction after, and then there are distinctions we don't all agree with. I mean, I don't know about you. I'm there are mid acts tribute, there are mid acts um, dispensationalists and guys who think the church starts and Pentecost. It goes on and on and on. Why is that not an objection? that we are slicing and dicing the word so much that you atomize it. And doesn't that present, uh, I don't really know how to frame this objection to talk, but that doesn't seem to be the tenor of scripture is to be sliced and diced in all these different ways. Yeah. I, I don't really know how to answer that except uh, let's, let's have the argument. If I make a distinction in, in the scripture, um, 
you should be able to argue from the text that that distinction is not there. Um, I, you know, I do think people can sometimes see distinction where there isn't them, but we can have that discussion because there's objective truth and there's objective hermeneutics and we can, we can wrestle with those things, right? Very good. Um, and see, that's again a plug to have you come back because that's really a hermeneutical <laughs> philosophical issue, isn't it? Yes, yes, which uh, I need to study. I'm, I'm looking forward to diving into that topic in the future. The, um, uh, I, I will assume that you are an evangelical Thomist, um, yes. at least because your SES background and people are probably lost what that means. But we, again, if you want to, it is not dispensationalism that makes the distinctions. It's our Thomists that make the distinctions, man. <laughs> or our, uh, our autism. <laughs> there you go. My, my, um, that objection has just come up a whole lot, but it, it does tend to come up as a as a general tenor argument. My my personal favorite response is to say, I like the way you've you've rooted it and well, it's a textual issue. Let's just dismiss it, look at the text. But I think everybody makes distinctions. Uh, my yeah. friend, do you know do you know Sean at Rev Reads, Sean Wilson? Do you see him yes. posting? Yeah, he's, he's a great guy. I, I love Sean. He's so cool. But he um he like he likes to uh, I'm gonna lose my train of thought as soon as I said that. Uh, this oh yeah, he likes to fuss about uh, the covenant theological how they're always making a dis distinction between God's secret will and His revealed will. Oh, He's like yeah. that distinction doesn't exist, but he he just blasts that. So my suggestion is we're all making distinctions, and the question is the validity of the distinction. Theology itself, it's 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 the science of proper distinctions based on the text, something like that. I'm not sure yeah. if that's phrased right, but something like that. Yeah, and and. Um... You know, uh, you can always dive down and and uh, look at things uh, at a more granular level, and more distinctions will will uh, emerge. But that doesn't mean that they uh, that doesn't mean there isn't some unity uh, above them as well. Love it. So I think um, before I ask you to recap, just quickly. Um... This has been phenomenal. Do, did, did we hit everything you wanted to cover? Do you feel like that you got to lay, lay your case out how ecclesiology touches on eschatology or leads to or impacts? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I could I could throw out um I could throw out a, a few quotes. Uh, yes, please. Ryrie says, um, oh, so Ryrie says that. Uh, the doctrine of the church is the touchstone of pre-tribulationism and dispensationalism mm. more generally. In, in other words, uh, the doctrine of the church uh, really affects things like, does the rapture happen before the tribulation or not as well? And, and it really is, uh, people associate dispensationalism with eschatology and mm -hmm. we are known for our eschatology, but the insight of people like John Nelson Darby and other early dispensationalists uh, uh, is really an insight into what is the church uh, and the nature of the church and the, and the believer's relationship to the law, which affects all these other things we've been talking about. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that uh, just to, just to wrap up, I think that would, I think I have covered what i wanted to talk about here is just that you know you you talked about the you can look at how eschatology affects ecclesiology and we've been talking about how ecclesiology affects eschatology and it really is both sides of the same coin um and i just want to say seriously i mean i i i I don't want to pat myself on the back. I, I went to a seminary for a very long time um and this the way that you phrase this night it's as i think back yeah we've talked about some things in my education but that's this was never an emphasis in the way that it was approached in in my studies. The the way you framed it is a is an interesting way. And even like the point that we can't cover everything, but the point that you're making, and you've touched on a few times, the relationship between the church and the law. That yeah. really is an eschatological issue, or it touches on it, it touches your view of the church is going to affect that as well. And so people who think, well, the church is under the law in some sense, well, that's because you have an ecclesiological issue. Yes. What is the church? Yes. Yes, that's absolutely. And, and, and you made a point earlier about um, don't, uh, don't let your systematic alter your reading of scripture. And what I've tried to do tonight is present an inductive case for that ecclesiology. Um, and, and and so, uh, you know, there there is uh, 
you know, your your prior commitments, your preconditions of knowledge affect your reading of the text. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that you could make an objective case for this understanding of the nature of the church from the passages that we we sure. want. I, I think as I'm hearing you and summarizing Ephesians, your case on Ephesians one through three, uh, and the central claim that I'm taking out of that is emphasizing the newness of the mystery of the church that that, that can't, if it's truly new, if it's truly a, a mystery that's been revealed now, then we can't yeah. take that as having been, this is not the fulfillment prophesied, because that means there's the, the, old, the old prophecies still have to be fulfilled. Right. That entails a difference. And then all the objections I tried to raise, well, in fact, it wasn't really. So your logic was, if it's new, well, then I'm trying, I try with those objects. Well, it wasn't really new. That was what I was trying to get at. Right. Cause those yeah. other passages yeah. and you're saying, well, no, I mean, those were it, talking about the kingdom. They, it, it really is new. Yes. Yeah. It really is new. And it's, and it really is a mystery. It's not just a new thing that was prophesied before and is now suddenly happening because it's a new thing. No, it wasn't even prophesied before, right? And so all those pro- prophecies in the Old Testament, they still await a future fulfillment after this time that we're in now. That's really cool. Really, really helpful. Well, my internal buzzer is going off really, really bad. So let's um, finish up here. And one more time, uh, I have I have pulled up both your blog. I'm going to show this on the screen one more time. Tell me one more time about your blog, which is so well managed and you update it every day, I know. <laughs> and your Twitter and the things you're doing. Do you do you write? I mean, well, if people who, man, Dave is awesome. I want more. Where, where, where do we go? What do we get? Uh, yeah, again, I just have a really neglected blog at uh, testing521.com. And then you can follow me at Twitter uh, at testing521.com. I guess it's X now, whatever, at testing521. It'll always be Twitter. Uh, so yes. it's like, just like it's still Facebook. It's not meta. I will never call it meta. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Somebody. and, and uh, that, you know, I'm not uh, I'm not super active on the blog, but uh, every once in a while I'll add something there and I'm pretty active on Twitter. So um, reach out to me um, and uh, subscribe to Chris's there blog. There you go. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, there you go. You're a Christian, you're an evangelical, you're dispensational, and you're a Thomist. We again, we're, I'm going to have to get back because these, these, this connection of an evangelical dispensational Thomist has people going, how can you possibly put those things together? All in the water, they don't mix. And I am an evangelical dispensational Thomist. And so I'm like, this is it's fun. It, it, we are. And especially throw a little bit of free grace soteriology on top of that. And people, then people's like, <laughs> I think. You and Jeff Lenhart are probably the only two people in the world who get me. <laughs> I don't know if you know Jeff or not. He's uh, another SES guy. Uh, Anthony Miller, if you follow him on Twitter, he would get you too. He's all of those I, as well. I feel like I might, but I, I haven't interacted enough with him or not to... Uh, yeah, he's, to, he's to, a good guy. He's but great. There's a couple of us. There's there's a handful of us. May our, may our tribe increase. So no YouTube channel yet though, right? Uh, you know, you can find me on YouTube. Um, same same handle. If you search testing five two one on YouTube, you'll find me on there. Again, it's it's even more neglected than the blog, but <laughs> but that might change. Um, that might change in the future, Lord willing. So we'll see. Well, finish finish up your studies, and you'll probably do doctoral work. One, are you doing doctoral work yet? You do so you're a master's program. No, you have not yet. Which one? Um, Lord willing, that would be awesome. I'm going to finish up this master's program, and then awesome. Well, Matt, you, I don't know how somebody who you, you have such a phenomenal insight in the way that you approach, approach all of this. So I'm looking forward to continue that conversation. Uh, Dave, thank you very, very much for coming on. I mean it when I say that this has been enriching for me. Um, this has been phenomenal. I hope that I hope I hope that you this has been as fun for you as it as it has been on my side. Absolutely. It's an honor, Chris. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Very much. All right. As I always say, Dave, and I'll say it again, until next time, may God richly bless you. Thanks much. Bye, y'all.